So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Women in World Trade New England program. We have a great event ahead focused on the intersection of innovation, entrepreneurship, and global markets. Uh, but before we jump in, I want to just make a couple of brief announcements about upcoming programs. Uh, first, uh, we have a program coming up on Tuesday, April 27th at noon with Lori Heinel, the Global Chief Investment Officer at State Street Global Advisors. She is going to be addressing the role of international trade dynamics and geopolitics in the 2021 Global Investment Outlook. And what's interesting is that today, Lori is the Deputy Global Chief Investment Officer, but tomorrow she takes on the top job uh, as the chief. And so we are gonna be among the first public programs that she does in that new role. The program will be moderated by our member, Krista Blyleben, who uh, many of you know is managing partner at Mass Global Partners, uh, the former head of the Massachusetts Office of International Trade and Investment, and also a, man a former managing director at Bank of America Securities. So she brings in a nice trade and banking background to uh, lead us through the dialogue with Lori Heinel. Next, in May, we thought we'd do something a little different. Uh, we have always enjoyed sort of the pre-event conversations with many of you when we have done Zoom-based programs. And Ursula and I thought that we would get the group together without a speaker for a, a purely um, social event, a networking social, uh, which we plan to do on Friday, May 21st at 4 o'clock p.m. So we're going to have sort of a drinks with the co-founders and please have a, a beverage of choice in front of you. And we just look forward to getting to know each other better. And with that, let's start our program. And I, I should have introduced myself to those of you who have not met. My name is Leslie Griffin, and I work together with Ursula uh, Wojciechowska on Women in World Trade. And I am pleased to kick this off uh, by introducing our moderator today. Uh, Jake Colvin is Vice President for Global Trade and Innovation at the National Foreign Trade Council, or NFTC, which is the oldest and largest business organization exclusively focused on US public policy affecting international trade and investment. But Jake also has another hat and that's the hat may be wearing today, he also serves as executive director of the Global Innovation Forum, which is housed in the NFTC's nonprofit arm. And it brings together startups, um, universities, nonprofit leaders, um, and, and entrepreneurs to explore the role of government policies and programs in the success of small businesses in going global. And what I always find impressive about uh, Jake's form of advocacy is he generally lets the, the small businesses tell their own stories. And he has a wonderful assortment of reports on women entrepreneurs and the challenges that they have faced going global and the opportunities they see um, if given the right suite of, of support and government policies. So I would encourage you to check out the Global Innovation Forum website. Uh, so let me turn it over to Jake, who is going to introduce Dr. Abby Barrow, our speaker today, who as many of you know, is a real pioneer in the tech innovation space in our region. So look forward to a great conversation. Jake, let me turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Leslie. And, and thanks as well to Ursula and Day and to Women in World Trade in New England for, uh, for hosting the discussion. Um, Leslie, really appreciate the, the kind introduction. Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm just really looking forward to the chance to, to facilitate this conversation with Dr. Barrow. Um, so for the past two and a half years, um, Dr. Barrow has served as managing partner of Cambridge Innovation Partners, uh, but she has more than 30 years of experience working with entrepreneurs and innovation ecosystems. Um, so she has a degree in mechanical engineering, she's got a PhD in economic development and tech transfer, and she's also worked in university-led innovation hubs uh, from California to Massachusetts. Um, she is also, in addition to her current role, uh, chair of VentureWell, which assists uh, student in, uh, inventors. And so Abby, it's, it's been great to have a chance to get to know you uh, and really uh, appreciate you making time for this discussion. Um, I, I think, you know, my hope generally is to focus the conversation on, on kind of that nexus of university-led innovation and entrepreneurship uh, and global markets. Um, and I think given your, your background and, and your current role, I wanted to start specifically uh, talking about the role of American universities in encouraging global innovation. 
Um, so thought we could do this in, in kind of a, an initial question and answer format. Um, but uh, those of you who are participating in the discussion, I know the chat is open. Uh, the Q&A also appears to be open. Um, I think uh, probably easier for me to, um, to pay attention to the chat right now. And so um, if you can put um, questions, comments um, in the chat, that would be great. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to facilitate the conversation and get to as, as many of them as, as I can. Um, but maybe start off with a broad question, Abby. Um, I, I mean, in your opinion, how well positioned are American universities to give emerging entrepreneurs the tools to commercialize innovations globally? Um, and given the, the focus of the group, you know, are there, um, um, how well positioned are universities, particularly with respect to um, encouraging women entrepreneurs? So I think the answer is getting better. Um, so I think universities um, have been recognizing in general that women have not been participating as much in commercialization as men. And, you know, in, in many areas, as other areas as well within institutions, as, you know, famous story at MIT where a woman faculty member went around measuring space and got the data to show that she had less space than men did. And I think we've seen the same thing in innovation and patenting because women have been participating at lower rates. And I think the first thing you need to do is become aware of the situation, then you can start improving outreach. Um, certainly, if you look at some institutions, they are developing very specific um, women focused programs, or now they're more um, women and members of traditionally underrepresented um, populations. Um, so actually one of the institutions I used to work to work at uh, University of California, San Diego has a very good program called Starter started at as my startup XX, um, purely focused on teams that either have a woman or a member of a traditionally underrepresented population on the team. So really important to sort of make that those inclusive spaces. Um, but universities in the in the last 20 years, for both for all types of inventors, um, have really developed new suites of programs to support startups and to really encourage more startups coming out of their institutions. So more proof of concept funding, more mentors, entrepreneurs in residence, more support of student entrepreneurs. You mentioned I was on Venture Well. We focus exclusively on students and help them to start companies. Um, many universities have incubators. So actually with the big universities, they actually develop their own ecosystems within the universities with multiple programs that are supporting entrepreneurship and spin-offs at, at all levels. So I, th I think the answer is getting better. Um, still some way to go. Uh, well, that's good to hear and uh, maybe get back to that in a little while. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that, that we think a lot about as we talk to the entrepreneurs in our network is um, kind of lessons learned from COVID-19 for, for innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I know it's something that you and I had spoken about um, in the past. And so uh, can you give kind of an example of the success of, of the university ecosystem in promoting global innovation in response to COVID-19 or, or some other vaccine development? Yeah, so, so actually I think um, vaccine development has really showcased to a general population how important university-based research is or academic research. So I know Jake, you've been getting the Pfizer vaccine, but Moderna is the, is the story from Cambridge. Um, and it's a fabulous illustration of how innovation and the ecosystem work together in Boston. Um, so this was a company, it was founded by two Harvard stem cell researchers. Um, they pulled in and talked to a leading MIT researcher, Bob Langer. He pulled in um, an investor. Um, they put together the company. They went out and recruited internationally. So they brought in Stefan Bancel um, from France to be the CEO. Um, they were pretty secretive to begin with. They did license a lot of technology out of Penn and out of Harvard. Um, and here you have 10 years later, suddenly um, they have the vaccine technology. They'd been working in other areas of vaccines, but as soon as COVID started to become an issue in January last year, they started developing um, a vaccine for COVID. Um, I should also mention their CSO, uh, Melissa Moore, um, she came out of the UMass Med School. She'd been a career scientist, uh, research scientist. She actually emailed the CEO and said, you should meet me, I'm the leader in this field. Um, she went on their advisory board, their scientific advisory board, and then she became 
their um, chief scientific officer. I don't think when she sent that email, she ever dreamt that she would become their chief scientific officer. <laughs> so that's a sort of perfect story of the Boston ecosystem of research, money, talent, um, coming together and creating this startup company. Um, if you look at uh, Pfizer, similar story for BioNTech, uh, obviously in Germany, but again, um, a spin-off company, not focused initially on vaccines. They were actually working on cancer um, drugs and they will certainly go back to that. Um, and then if we flip to the UK, um, certainly it, in the news a lot is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So that was totally developed within Oxford University and then licensed to AstraZeneca for global distribution. Um, still ha has some issues and questions, um, but it's now approved in over a hundred countries and um, many, many millions of, of doses have been given. So, so really interesting um, sort of showcase of how universities are really, really important in developing new technologies. The other thing that I should probably mention is one of the other things that universities do to support innovation is to um, have test beds and allow people to come in and use their major equipment. So federal government invests very heavily um, in equipping these labs so they can do really bleeding edge research. But most companies can come in and use that. And, and maybe the sort of biggest flip here at the moment has been the Broad Institute, huge um, resources. But what they did was they really turned the switch and went into COVID testing. So actually Broad has actually been doing commercial testing and have done about 5% of all US COVID tests um, so far. So for, from my perspective, these make it a great, great story to show people how important universities are and how that long-term investment is. But I think as, as we saw with the, you know, the uh, Moderna story, it's the research, the money, the talent. We also have very supportive government. Um, so the Mass Life Sciences Center, the Mass Clean Energy Center also really help both universities and startups get together. Um, we have good space, um, particularly we have supported lab space. And I think the other thing that we have here, and you know, I think this is not uh, unique to, to Boston, it was certainly also important when I worked in San Diego, but an entrepreneurial culture and a very supportive culture. And I think, you know, almost anybody here in pre-COVID times, they would sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and listen to your idea and give you suggestions. Um, but now they'll do the same as a virtual coffee and sit on Zoom with you and have a quick chat and give you feedback. So I think all of these things really help to really create that environment that supports um, the promotion of global innovation from, from the universities. Thanks, Abby. It's, it's a fascinating topic, and I think one we could spend more than an hour on. I, I mean, you know, you can then get into some of the policy underpinnings of all of this. And, you know, there's a debate going on right now about um, uh, intellectual property rights protection in, in light of, of vaccine development and, and distribution. Um, and, and so, you know, to me, that's, that's another area that um, kind of underpins the ability of um, universities and companies to um, to commercialize the, the innovations that, that come out of the university ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, that, as you said, that's a really interesting topic and we could spend a lot of time on that and um, it's pretty contentious, but the IP is only the beginning of the story. It's all the supplies and the manufacturing is that is what's really holding back, you know, the, the global um, development and production of of vaccines, it's not it's not that little piece of IP at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, that's right, and and uh, you know between um, the licensing arrangements, but then the capacity, the manufacturing capacity issues, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the uh, the kind of customs and trade facilitation issues, needing to mm -hmm. ship cold storage and, and all that. It's yeah, I, we work with some of our companies on this, and it's just I mean there are so many challenges. It's been fascinating to unpack. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really interesting policy area. I, I did want to press on one. Uh, additional issue related to COVID-19, which is that, um, you know, it's become even more difficult for the United States to recruit foreign students in the current environment. Um, it wasn't easy before, uh, and also with respect to entrepreneurs, you know, we don't have anything akin to a startup visa um, to easily allow uh, entrepreneurs to come to the United States unless you drop 
a significant amount of money. Um, and so, you know, as you look out in a post-COVID landscape, what needs to happen to make sure that the United States is attracting the best and the brightest students and entrepreneurs? Well, I, you know, first I agree with you, and I think it was um, particularly hard under the previous administration to recruit a, a lot of students. Um, I should note that it's probably not an issue for Harvard and MIT. They get all the students they want, um, and they certainly get the best and the brightest all the time. But it's particularly an issue for smaller institutions. And I think the biggest issue is actually with PhD students, because that's been such um, a big way that the US has kept you know, the research engine going by having all the PhD students doing a lot of the underlying research in um, the inventions that come out of the institutions. Um, and I think, you know, I do some work at the moment with Boston University. If you look at over there, 25% of their students are foreign students, um, slightly lower percentage at undergraduate than at graduate, but it's also a huge finance issue for institutions and frankly for the state of Massachusetts because we have so many foreign students coming in. Um, so I think global perception is one thing. I think showing that you're still open um, and that you're very active in promoting a global brand is really important and changing global perception. Um, obviously ability to get visas is important for students at all levels, um, but also allowing them to work after graduation or work during the summers is just really important. And, you know, I know you've worked on the H-1B visa issue and the entrepreneurship visa issues, but, but those are really important that you show that you're, you're open to the people coming in to start these businesses. Uh, you know, it makes you want to cry when you have a graduate student who's got an idea, who's thinking of starting a company or indeed starting a company, and then they can't get a visa to stay here and they go back and yeah. we lose the company. Um, you know, it, it's certainly, certainly not good. Yeah, no, and, and you hear far too many of those stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, well, look, I, I wanted to maybe switch the conversation uh, now to talk about how communities and governments can support um, globally minded uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, and so, I, you know, just given your experience working with um, entrepreneurs and startup companies, um, to what extent do founders and, and maybe even particular women, women founders uh, think about accessing global markets from, from day one? Um, and maybe just to add to that, you know, have you observed any lessons from their ability to access those global markets given COVID? Um, so, so I think in, in tech, nearly all founders start thinking globally from day one um, and not just, uh, not just thinking from their perspective of what are we going to do in international markets, but also what's coming over the horizon in international markets that's going to impact what we do. You know, no tech starter knows that everything is in the US. They, we all know that, you know, there's stuff going on, you know, from Northern Finland to South Africa that might impact what, what we do. So I think everybody starts their company with a, a global awareness, but I think some of it is also making sure that with those startups that they're getting support from people who think very globally. Um, so the mentors, investors who have international trade experience, um, you know, I think it's, it's been very hard with COVID and the lack of travel because people haven't been able to, to get overseas. Um, but in my consulting business, I've actually been really surprised at how many missions are still coming into Boston. Um, so normally they'd come here, they'd spend a week here, week, a month, um, go around, meet with everybody, get a lot of input. And we've seen those come in as virtual missions. So they're still coming in, they're doing the training programs, they're meeting people, they're networking and developing knowledge of the market so that what these companies really want to do while they can't physically travel here is really set up um, their expertise so they're ready to go as soon as the travel is able to happen again, but also to make those connections so that when they can get here, they've already got a set of friends that they, they can meet with and learn. I think the other thing that's really interesting is that every event has gone 
virtual. Um, so I think people are attending events that they never thought they would be able to before without, you know, physically going to a conference. Um, you know, I'm based in the Cambridge Innovation Center and the Venture Cafe, the Thursday afternoon um, meetup is global. They got people from all over the world. Um, Mass General Hospital has a huge world medic medical medical innovation forum that they hold every year. So obviously last year the plug got pulled on that um, just before it was supposed to happen. Um, usually they get four to 500 attendees. They made it a free virtual event. They got over 20,000 attendees and it was oh. truly global. I think they had people from over a hundred countries. So, you know, COVID very bad, obviously. Um, but it really has opened up some areas. Um, you know, companies all over Europe are coming into events here, doing mentoring programs at MassBio. Um, I'm hoping that some of our startup companies are taking advantage of what is happening in Europe and in other parts of the world so that they can really plug into, the, into those markets. But certainly I'm seeing it still coming in here, it's, which is great. And that, what are you seeing? Um, I, well, it, good to hear that um, that they're finding workarounds to, to meeting in person. I, I, you know, I think generally, and, and we saw this before the pandemic, that um, access to global markets is particularly important for women entrepreneurs. Um, you know, during the Obama administration, USTR put out some statistics that suggested that uh, women-owned firms that export benefit from this. They call it an exporter premium, so that. On average, they pay higher salaries, they're more profitable, they're more productive, both in women-owned businesses that don't export and men-owned businesses that do. Um, and, and so we've seen that borne out anecdotally uh, with a, a number of the women-owned businesses that we've gotten to know through, through the Global Innovation Forum. Um, you know, we've spoken to businesses in the United States, from, from Maryland and, and elsewhere, from the UK, from Mexico, from Indonesia. And you know, there's this common refrain of, um, it, it was difficult to get traction locally but they were able to get some good press hits, some dis some distributors, um, uh, some customers overseas, direct to consumer, uh, and it gave them both sort of the confidence and the credibility back home, um, and often gave them access to additional funding options as well. And so, um, uh, you know, I think that's that's an important piece that we try to um, to elevate, uh, and that kind of exporter premium is is also holds true for um, for minority owned businesses, uh, and particularly black owned businesses. Yeah, I think I just I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, just to add to that, I think, you know, I participate in some training programs with entrepreneurs coming here for um, different programs, for anyway, from a month to six months. And I think um, particularly the women entrepreneurs who come over when they go back, they're seen very differently, that they've been in the US they've, and, and they're more aggressive and they've learned how to sell their business better. Um, so I think they do succeed more. But, but yeah, there's nothing like being recognized, you know, uh, overseas or outside your region to be seen as an expert and to, to you know, get more attention. Exactly. Um, I was just gonna say, you know, I think what we've seen from the pandemic is that um, this combination of use of digital tools and access to, um, to global markets um, has both sort of simultaneously helped to improve um, startups and small businesses resilience. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's, there's statistics that three out of four small businesses increased their use of digital tools uh, in response to the pandemic, uh, and that those that did so were um, more likely, were, were, excuse me, that were less likely to experience economic hardship. Uh, and the same thing with global markets, that if you're using digital tools um, during the pandemic, you're accessing global markets more, and then um, your business has uh, sort of survived better uh, during the pandemic. Um, I, so, you know, you started talking about um, communities and, and kind of the ecosystem in, in Massachusetts and, and also a little bit in California, um, but what kind of resources, you know, whether they're government or community or, or nonprofit or, or for-profit uh, are available to help uh, startups engage globally? Um, and are, I mean, to your point about sort of regional efforts, are, are there particular regional programs that work well? Yeah, there are, you know, obviously, um... The Small Business Development Center's Export Center um, is very active, has very good training and support programs and particularly helpful on compliance issues. Um, so if you're thinking about doing inter anything internationally, you absolutely need to go and see them. Um, a lot of our state programs, uh, we have a, 
pretty small office of international trade and investment, but the Mass Life Sciences Center and Mass CEC have done quite a lot of international programs in the past, and I'm sure they're thinking of that in the future too. <clears throat> and um, we have a US Department of Commerce um, office here as well, which um, supports startups. I think, you know, one of the things that we're, we're very lucky to have though, is a group of consulates who are very engaged in the local community and particularly the tech community and the research community. Um, so, you know, I, I can't name them all, there's so many, but, you know, Japan, you know, France, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, obviously, um, I shouldn't forget those. Um, but they do a lot of programs, but they're also really set up to help people find resources overseas. Um, I've got Canada as well. They've got, a, they're, they're probably the biggest consulate here, obviously is our nearest and biggest trading neighbor. So, so the consulates have a lot of programs and a lot of activities. Um, and then some very specific accelerators um, that focus on, on different areas have, have strong links. Um, and then finally, you know, women in world trade. Uh, I think women in world trade hopes to become a resource. There are other um, also national groups, you know, the biotech Brits get together every so often. Um, the French have a, have a group. Thai is the Indus Entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of ways that we keep these networks going and um, either officially or unofficially have support programs to help people think more internationally and, and get out, outside of our little boundaries. It's a, it's a great call out for um, the consulates. And I think the, there's an analog to that, which is um, the, the US commercial officers in embassies abroad um, who can also provide good value and, and they're yeah. out to that for you. Yeah, um, absolutely. We need to take full advantage of what our taxes are paying for. <laughs> That's right. Um, I, I would also call out just I think, you know, the, where I've seen success has been where there is public and private sector collaborations. Um, you know, one thing that we do is we have um, a, a really cool partnership with the U.S. Department of Commerce on something called Startup Global. Um, and it's something that we launched with Secretary Pritzker during the, the Obama administration. And the idea really is just to get entrepreneurs to think global from day one. Um, but I think what's, what's useful about it is that um, we bring together these government officials um, to talk about trade promotion programs, the SBA resources that you just mentioned, uh, what PTO does. Um, but we also bring together um, private sector companies, PayPal, UPS, Intuit, and, and peers that have already gone global. And it's kind of that, um, that interaction and that um, you know, realization of its, its private and public sector together that I, I think um, spurs these, these kind of really unique conversations. Yeah. Um, so turning, I, I wanna to turn to, to funding and, and specifically maybe with, with women entrepreneurs and, um, and underserved communities. Um, I, you know, are there efforts that you would point to that can help women entrepreneurs um, access funding or otherwise connect and succeed? Um, or, uh, you know, are there efforts to provide funding to black, indigenous, and minority populations? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in some ways this goes back to, to the first answer is that recognizing that it's an issue is indeed a, a first step. And I think many venture capitalists and investors have been very embarrassed when they've sort of reflected on, on their situation and, um, look at how few women and minorities have been involved in the startups that they're funding. So I think there's been, that, that's, that's the beginning. Um, Adventure World, we actually recently did a study on, you know, how to make innovation and entrepreneurship programs more inclusive. And I think we came out with, with like five or six main, main things. One was really to do um, very authentic outreach to really go out and get the get the people who aren't traditionally coming and make sure that they feel welcome by creating very inclusive spaces for them, um, programs and activities where they can join in, and that those can be virtual programs. And in some cases, people feel more included in virtual spaces than in physical spaces. Um, helping build confidence, so you know 
a lot of people have imposter syndrome, but helping them work out that they're not imposters, that they have every right to be there um, as everybody else and that they're as good as everybody else. Um, engaging faculty and other leaders. So making sure that there is support from, from the top up. Um, and show that there's multiple pathways to success. You know, it doesn't always have to be the same way. Um, and then I think just making sure that um, diversity and, it, and inclusion is uh, part of absolutely everything that you do. And it sort of really goes into the core values of um, the institution or the company that you're doing. Uh, I think we've seen the development of some very specific funds here. Golden Seeds um, is an angel group that focuses mainly on um, women started companies. Um, we have a venture firm, Reinventure Capital, that also focuses much more on women and minorities. And I think we're seeing more women become VC partners, which is something that really does change the attitudes and also the networks that these companies plug into. Um, what's interesting, though, you know, women and women led teams don't raise so much money in A rounds. Um, compared to men and certainly don't do very well, but they do do much better in raising B rounds. So that once they've actually got over that first hurdle of getting their first funding, they actually do better than the, the, the male led teams. Um, so, you know, I think we should all take encouragement from that and know that once you get, get through the first hurdle, you're actually more likely to succeed. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Abby. I, so Paula um, put a question, Paula Murphy put a question in, in the chat. And so wanted to, to maybe turn to that next. And, uh, and the question was, have you seen any meaningful impact uh, of increased foreign investment restrictions for US entrepreneurs who are seeking funding or venture capital from foreign investors? Uh, and the notice that we've seen lots of industries uh, impacted by these restrictions. Um, so, certainly, and I think, you know, the major one or issue there is China. Um, and, um, the, the sad thing is that, you know, as I said before, sometimes, you know, you work with a graduate student and they um, want to start a company and they can't get a visa. Sometimes they also find they can raise money at home more easily um, or take that money more easily. So I think we've seen some companies that have been set up, and I'm going to say China again, in China rather than here um, because they can get the funding over there more easily. Um, so it's absolutely an issue. Um, it's and it's in every sector, but certainly life sciences is one sector where I've seen that a couple of times. Well, and I I don't have any specific examples to point to, but um, you know this I completely agree with you, Abby. It's, it is all about China, and, and I think it it kind of um, it, it's across the board. It's it's physical goods and ICT infrastructure. Um, it's app development, and and you saw during the Trump administration some of the restrictions on uh, on WeChat and and uh, some of the payment companies. Um, it's investments, um, which Paul mentioned, uh, but it's also deemed exports and, and researchers um, who, who may or may not be able to come here. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think what I've seen from DC is that uh, there's certainly a shared bipartisan concern across multiple presidents and Congress about um, the national security implications of, of yeah. China. Um, and so I, I think, you know, now it's a question of how the Biden administration and Congress are going to um, balance the national security considerations with economic considerations. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it is a major issue and there are a lot of considerations and, you know, universities have to comply with export control rules just like everybody else. So it's a, it's a big issue on university campuses as well. Exactly. Um, so I wanted to, you know, since we started talking about um, the Biden administration, I wanted to ask you a question about that. Um, I, you know, there seems to be a, a kind of whole of government focus in the Biden administration uh, on equity and inclusion. And, you know, I see that at the White House, where, where the Gender Policy Council has been set up, um, the Small Business Administration, the International Trade Administration, USTR. Um, and, and so, you know, can you, can you suggest uh, some policy initiatives that can help support global entrepreneurship and, and maybe specifically support women? Well, I, I think, you know, it's obviously um, something that's key to this administration and we're going to see huge changes. Um, but maybe I can point to something at the patent office. Um, 
that's where you know you you hope um, to uh, protect your your IP. Um, but they are really uh, trying to address the patent gap that much fewer of people of the number of people who um, patent inventions are women and minorities. Um, so there has been a sort of national strategy for expanding American innovation. So it is more inclusive. Um, so I think they are trying to create more capacity. Um, they are looking not just um, at the US, but internationally um, to have more IP educational opportunities, um, help develop more curricula, um, do more one-on-one -on -one teaching and support. Um, so really sort of getting out there more to help people learn about patenting and how, how to get patents. Um, they want to um, increase access, particularly amongst student entrepreneurs so that they can uh, better protect their ideas and um, get, get interest from potentially investors and build their credentials. Obviously a patent is the, you know, one of the first building blocks for a tech startup or many tech startups. Um, and then, you know, establishing goals, um, both measuring but establishing goals are really important and communicating what you have been doing, what resources are available and making that transparent um, for your stakeholders. So, you know, and that's just what's happening at the patent office. I'm sure that you probably have better knowledge than me that is happening in all sorts of, of other agencies. But I think also from a, from a global perspective, just having more women in leadership positions. I think, you know, the US was seen differently when we had women secretaries of state, you know, going back to Madeleine Albright, but also Hillary Clinton. And now that we have a woman um, VP, all of those are really important to show, you know, that, that we are a more inclusive um, society. Absolutely. And, and I think, um, I, you know, one thing that I've noticed um, since January is, has been the Biden administration just saying over and over that um, a focus on inclusive growth and trade uh, and women entrepreneurship and, and uh, minority owned businesses are, are priorities for us. And, and so um, that's gotten everyone to think differently uh, here in DC. And I can tell you, there've been a lot more conversations and, and um, questions about how can we help uh, than there were over the past four years. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think one of the places you mentioned the patent office. I think another one of the places where uh, where more can be done is um, with trade promotion programs and, and services. So Australia did a study um, uh, a couple of years ago that suggested that women are woefully underrepresented in uh, as clients of, of government trade promotion programs. Um, and so, you know, how can the United States and other countries? Um, recruit more clients um, who are women who um, are minority owned businesses. I, I think that's that's one area where um, certainly I expect the Biden administration to focus. Yeah, Canada was going to do a program last year um, solely for women, a trade mission solely for women led businesses. Um, sadly, that was supposed to be in Boston, I think like March 23rd or something last year. So that was a mission that didn't happen, but hopefully um, when we can travel again and the borders are open again, it'll happen. Well, and Canada has also been a leader on, on trade policy, right? And so, you know, they've built commitments on gender into their trade agreements. Yeah. Um, there's a way to, you know, I, I feel like there's a way for the United States to dock onto that and, uh, and expand not only to gender, but, um, but to racial equity as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a, another question in, in, the, uh, in the chat from, from Dawn. Um, and so do you have any comments about introducing uh, innovators to, to those in larger companies? Uh, the OEMs and top tiers um, who are responsible for sourcing. Um, she said it's, it's not always easy to figure out who those people are, uh, wondering if you have suggestions of good sources or networks, uh, particularly in New England. Yeah, uh, sadly, there isn't a sort of magic directory that you can plug into for all these people. But um, a lot of um, the events, particularly if, you know, the uh, CIC's Venture Cafe, um, they will often have speakers or they will actually have whole evenings that are um, sponsored by different um, large corporates. Um, I mean, one of the things, again, you know, this is part of the Boston ecosystem that I didn't talk about, but, you know, 
all of the big pharma companies have offices here and have scouts here, but you know, BASF have a venture fund here, Saint-Gobain have technology scout here. Th there's no official list of them, but if you get in to meet with one, they usually know the others, so they can help you find the others. Um, and then these people are always speaking at events or going to networking events because that's their job to get out there and, and find people. And then, you know, find, find your people also who are very well plugged in. So, you know, if we have coffee, I can probably give you three different corporate scouts that you could probably talk to in your sector. So it's really a question of getting in and doing good networking. I found too that um, particularly if you have, um, if there's, there really is a fit, um, you can approach some companies directly. Um, Abby, as, as you mentioned, you know, a number of the pharma companies have representation in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, I, you know, I found that with, with tech companies as well. Uh, but there's also, I, Abby, I don't, I, did, I don't think I heard you mention Mass Challenge. Um, I yeah. think they do actually a, a really good job of connecting their cohorts with um, you know, the, kind of the innovation leaders at large corporates. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Mass Challenge has got very big, large corporates, but, you know, if you're in clean energy, Greentown Labs has got all the big corporates, you know, Shell, Sangobain, you know, you name it, BP, they're all very involved. So, you know, finding those places where they gather is really important. Yeah. Um, so, Urs Abby, Ursula asked, um, how do cultural differences come into play? And uh, adding that in some countries, women in business are still not encouraged. So, uh, how can how can we help? I, I think that's that's training and and support. Um, certainly, it's hard for women to do business in a lot of countries, but it's it's actually easier um, in others than you would imagine. Um, so it, it it's support. But I think you know if you're looking, you know, to go to most of Europe, to go to most of Asia, it's now fairly um, open to women led businesses. So, you know, I think you just have to get out there and, and start meeting people. Um, I, you know, we, we've also been wrestling this with this too, right? I mean, I think we see global markets as part of the solution um, and part of the way for women entrepreneurs to gain credibility. And so is there a way to use international institutions like the World Trade Organization or Asia Pacific Cooperation Forum or some, you know, U.S. and Canada-led initiative where you kind of globalize um, the kind of network building and, and have a, a, pro a public private sector um, role to play in encouraging those entrepreneurs to find new funding sources to connect with each other. Um, you know, there, there are private sector or, or NGOs that do this well already. Vital Voices is a partner of ours and, and they're terrific. They've got this amazing global network um, where they, they train women on a regular basis, including in person, because they know how important the physical connections are. Um, I wanted to, uh, so there, there are now more and more comments rolling into the, uh, the chat. I'll, I'll see how many we can get to. But Leslie asked, um, how important is it that innovation be aligned with social impact? With the growing pressures on companies to measure, disclose, and improve on ESG-related issues, do you see a growing sense of purpose behind innovation work in the community and globally? <laughs> yeah, yes, and I think women help to, to change that equation. Um, it, it's certainly something that, that starts on the bottom line, but you know, I, I think if you look at, and, and going back to the vaccine example, if you look at AstraZeneca, they dis determined that they would sell at cost for the first two years, the product. And I think there is more corporate responsibility coming through um, at, at all levels. And I think startups now, they don't know how they're gonna measure it, but they articulate it when they pitch themselves when they talk about what, they, what they're gonna do. I think the other thing, you know, from the students that, that I work with and a lot of the student teams, what we see at a lot of institutions is this huge engagement with student teams, both in sustainable technologies, but also in technologies and products for developing countries. Um, so, you know, we've had student teams that developed um, tiny little solar panels with reading lamps, LED lamps. Um, the student who started that, he came out of the University of Illinois in Chicago. He's now raised, I think, $80 million, really expanding that business in India and changing the way 
that in village India people read and particularly students and school students um, can do their homework at night. So I think we're seeing enormous um, change um, within those areas. Um, so I thought uh, maybe I would just uh, ask another question. I, I, we're all looking towards the new normal, and you know the new normal is probably uh, not like the old normal. Um, you know I don't think any anyone of us want to just do Zoom calls again. Um, but you know you talked about uh, kind of lessons learned and and sort of makeshift networking uh, when when folks can't travel. Where do you think um, we settle in the new normal over the next? you know, one, two, three years, uh, you know, let's assume that the vaccines go fairly smoothly and that um, we can all get on a plane again if we want to, um, you know, will we? And, and where does the, the kind of give and take of that university ecosystem that relies on um, travel and, and foreign students for, the, for its vibrancy, where does all that land? Well, I, I think, you know, what universities have learned is that it's really having people on campus that makes a big difference and having people really learning together. So I think universities aren't gonna see such huge changes, um, but I think the rest of us, there's some things that, that we're gonna be doing that we never thought we would be doing. I think that, you know, Zoom is here to stay or whatever Zoom equivalent we, we get moved to. Um, I think doing events that are more open and more inclusive um, will always in, now include digital events. Um, I think we're gonna, you know, video conference centers that really do have some partial video um, participation um, that's all going to stay um, and i think what's really interesting is what's going to happen to offices whether we have you know more flexible space but less dedicated personal space um, i think a lot of us has got used to doing some work from home and if we don't feel like going in we're not going in so I think that's going to be a major conversation in a lot of workplaces. And, you know, we know some of the big companies have said you, you never have to come back. I think a lot of people aren't going to want to do that, but there's certainly going to be more generous work from home policies than we've ever seen before. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a whole new world. I mean, in, in some ways, the question about the corporate scouts is, you know, do you need to find one that's local? You know, why, why do you need to bother these days? Because you can, you know, it doesn't matter that if they're in Germany or we had somebody from Spain in the chat saying, you know, I work for Spanish companies, you know, set up a meeting with them in Spain because you can do it on Zoom. I, yeah, exactly. Um, I, it's, it, it's interesting because we, I see, um, as I look towards whether, you know, how much we're going to travel again in the future and, and then talking with governments, um, I think it's the, the governments in particular where they do need the the face time to um, to hammer out deals and, and negotiate. It's um, it's a lot harder um, for them to do that, particularly when it's more than bilateral, when it's more than one on one. You know, if you're we do a lot of work with the World Trade Organization, and so as they're negotiating a new e-commerce agreement, um, it, it's real hard to do that among 60 different countries when you're doing it over you know whatever their Zoom equivalent is. Yeah, yeah. So I see that coming back and so you know we will we will probably travel as well because you know we do so along with those those negotiators yeah yeah it's we'll we'll all get back on planes one day <laughs> um so i i wanted to see uh, you know do you do you have any sense about how the startups that you work with target overseas markets i mean is there does do they look intentionally to you know one or two local markets like canada or mexico or china um, or where maybe there are trade agreements in place, um, language sort of affinities, or is it you know often less intentional and, and more kind of serendipitous? I, I I think you know most of most of the companies look at at Canada and Europe. Obviously, Europe is an even bigger market when you combine it than um, the U.S. But then the big question is, where do they enter them? Which bit of Europe do they enter and how do they enter? So that becomes a, a big issue as to, you know, basically picking a spot that they that they land in within within Europe. Um, the Asia is is harder. So unless you've got very good connections there, that's harder to to do as a as a first step. But it, it 
it's nearly always Europe and, and Canada is a nice local market that's easy to get into. And they speak the same language, most of them. Um, so it's easy, easy to go there. I, I you know, I, I think it, for, for us, it, it maybe depends too, whether you're um, a direct to consumer e-commerce company selling a piece of clothing or, or you know, maybe a, an app versus uh, you know a, a company in a heavily regulated industry like yeah. um, medical devices or, or education or, or something like that and uh, you know I, I think where we've seen the companies needing to be more intentional have been where you're regulated by two or three different you know industry or, or regulators uh, and you know you need to figure all that out on a country to country basis it's, it's another thing if you're just you know you've got this widget that you're selling to whoever will buy it on the internet yeah yeah um, and, you know, we had somebody from the, from the German uh, accelerator on here. I mean, a lot of people look at, look at Germany too. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really how you, how you find where you fit with, within Europe. And sometimes that's a personal relationship or a past relationship that you've got a network that you go to. I, just sort of following up on that, um, are, are there... Are there any success stories that come to mind of um, you know someone that had a company that has taken a business and or, or an idea and commercialized it and, and maybe gone global with it? Oh gosh, well our, our light company from Venture Well that's mainly in India but also in Africa now. We had another company that was looking at chilling milk, huge issue in India. Um, they went over, started the company in India and actually have now turned the company over completely to Indian management and come back here and are starting other companies. Um, I have a student company at the moment that's doing um, a technology to um, prolong the life of soft fruit. Um, so they're looking a lot at South America and Central America as markets for their technology. Obviously, we get a lot of fruit shipped up. So how do you work with those um, countries in order to preserve that fruit better and uh, reduce wastage. So lots of interesting examples of, of companies that are going going global. I, I there's a uh, there's a company that that we've gotten to know in uh, in Maryland um, called the Fresh Glow Co. And, and they make a piece of paper that you stick in a bag of apples or or broccoli, and it keeps it fresh for up to four times longer. So um, uh, it, it's it's a cool little invention. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, we're at actually at about the hour. So um, yeah. this was going to wrap up here. And then Abby, just uh, you know, really wanted to thank you for um, for your insights. Um, I enjoyed the conversation, um, and also wanted to thank uh, Women in World Trade New England for hosting, uh, and Leslie and Ursula uh, and Day. Uh, and then just finally wanted to thank all of you who took time out of your day to join us. Um, and so stay tuned for more details of future programming uh, from Women in World Trade New England. And thanks very much, everybody. Okay, and thanks Jake for moderating and participating. Appreciate thanks. it.